I'm Karen Hurd, and I'm here with our next edition of Asking for a Friend. And today, I'm just delighted to bring on a very special guest, Peter Economy. You may know him as the Inc. Leadership Guy. Uh, he has written uh, something like 125 books and has a brand new one out. And when I saw this title, I thought, we have to get Peter on this show. It's, wait, I'm working for who? And I was laughing because I remember distinctly one time when my boss said they were reorganizing and then I was going to have to go work for this jerk at work. And uh, I, I said those exact words, wait, I'm working for who? <laughs> so Peter, thank you so very much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much, Karen. It's great to be here today. Thank you. Great. So of course, uh, please, if you are just tuning in, we are talking about how do you deal with a jerk at work? And uh, so please don't put in the name of your jerk, <laughs> but we would love to you know, give us a, the challenging people. Just feel free to ask your questions in the comments as we go along. We'll stop from time to time and answer your questions. But um, I'd like to start Peter, because you talk about 16 types of jerks at work. And I was laughing because I was looking at all these and I'm like, yeah, I worked with every one of these people, which is, says something about my age, but also I think how frequent these issues surface. So of the 16, we can't talk about all 16 today, but what are some of the biggest challenging people that you see? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I listed 16 in the book and there's probably even more than that. Um, it's just amazing how many different ways people can be toxic, be mad, you know, mean, be nasty, uh, that kind of thing. So, um, but the, the ones that I think really the ones we probably most resonate with are people like, um, one of them is the credit thief. So I always encountered this when I was in, um, back in business days and you'd be in a staff meeting, and you'd be on a team or something. Let's say you're on a team that was supposed to accomplish something. And the team worked really well together. Maybe there were five of you. You're all working great together. And then there's somebody who kind of jumps up as a team leader and they end up taking all the credit. You know, they in the staff meeting with your boss and maybe your boss's boss, they're the one who jumps up and says, you know, I got this great thing done, you know, and I did all this and I did all that. And all of a sudden they're, they've got the, shi the spotlight shining on them. And so that's pretty typical. I mean, that kind of person, and, and it could be a coworker, it could be a teammate, or it could be your boss. I mean, I've seen that a lot too, obviously a boss who takes all the credit and doesn't acknowledge the fact that the people who work for them actually got the work done. Yeah, so that's, that's a big one for sure. It, it is such a big one. And you know, it's interesting in the Courageous Cultures research that we just finished, the most surprising fact was when we asked people why, if you had a really great idea to improve the customer experience or productivity of process, why would you hold it back? 56% said the reason they would not share an idea like that is because they wouldn't receive credit. And that's, that's huge. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, yeah, huge. That, that's crazy. And when it's interesting, back when we were doing you know, in-person keynotes and we would flash that statistic up on the, the big screen, you could just watch the rumble of the audience. People were like, mm -hmm, that happened to me. <laughs> yeah, I recognize that. I mean, I think I probably, you know, again, back in my corporate days, I wouldn't be surprised if I did that myself. If I thought, you know, maybe I'll just hang on to this idea a little bit longer because I want to get the credit for it, not my boss or not coworker or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So people are chiming in. That's so sad, right? It, it, it is. It so is sad. sad. It is sad. All um, right. So credit thief is a big one. What's another one? A micromanager. Uh, that's one of the 16 jerks that I, I have in this book. And yeah, that's a boss related one. That's that's the, the typical situation where you've got a boss who doesn't trust his or her employees. You know, the boss is like, oh, geez, I don't know if you guys are going to do it right. I'm not sure if I if I trust you. So I'm going to do it. Or, and I'll, uh, this is a big thing for delegation. So when I was a manager back in the old days, in the ancient times when I was a manager, you know, when I'd always make that decision, I, I had to make a decision when there was something to be done. So let's say I got a task from my boss to do something. I'd say, I think in my mind, I'd say, um, now should I do that myself? Because I know it's going to get done fast. It's going to get done right. Um, I'll have control of it. I'll, should I do that myself or should I assign that to one of my employees? oh, geez, it might take longer. They might screw it up. Um, they don't really know what they're doing. So then I would do it myself. 
So here I go. I'm being Mr. And, um, micromanager all the time. I'm always micromanaging the work and I'm micromanaging my people. If I do give them some work, then I'm on them all the time, like trying to figure out, you know, are you doing it right? Are you doing it on time? Uh, that's that's another one. Yeah, though those are, that's a really good one. And that is one that we hear so frequently when we're doing leadership development programs. People are saying, my boss is a micromanager. It's driving me crazy, which they would give me a little more grace. Okay, we're getting a few questions as coming in here. So Great. what if you suspect that you're the jerk? And I know you address this in the book. And one of your one of your tactics is make sure you're not the jerk, right? And right. So what, what do you do if you suspect that you might be the jerk? Yeah. Well, you have to get that awareness. I mean, that's the whole thing. I think a lot of people, um, you know, there's a certain number of people who consciously are jerks. I mean, they're consciously backstabbers. They're the ones who are, you know, they're out to get you. They, they get some pleasure out of that. They actually enjoy that. But there's also people who are jerks and unconscious jerks. They're the ones who aren't really malicious. They're not trying to, you know, be mean or anything, but they just are. That's just an unconscious thing. So let's assume you're you're an unconscious you're unconsciously being a jerk, and I think you just have to get that awareness first. You know, if people are are afraid to give you feedback, make sure that you've got a, a, a an environment where people are open to giving you feedback. You need that feedback. You know, at, look for a mentor. Look for someone who's going to give you honest feedback. Look for your colleagues to give you honest feedback. Um, and then once you've figured out that maybe you are being a jerk. Um, you know, take that feedback and and use it. Um, start, you know, neutralizing those behaviors. So if, if again, if you're being a micromanager, if you're not delegating work, you know, start delegating work. Start making sure that your people have the training they need to do the, the work properly and do it well and do it on time. So you, know, you have to step back out of that role, um, whatever that role may be. It might be being a micromanager, it might be being a credit thief, whatever it might be. But it, it, it starts with awareness. And a lot of us just aren't aware of, of what kind of behavior we we are you know, engaging in at work. Yeah, it's so interesting. I was in one of our programs one time. There was a, a guy who was a really smart PhD level scientist. And he had an administ. it was in the program. There was an administrator who was way, you know, a couple levels below. And at one point, so they're having this conversation. And anyway, you know, you're kind of a bully came out, you know? Wow. And so one of the things he went back and did was he checked in and he said, you know what, do you think I'm a bully? And other mm -hmm. people were saying, well, since you asked, <laughs> yes. And as it turns out, I mean, to your point, his intention, he was not trying to be a bully. Mm -hmm. He was just in his head. He was urgent. So he was coming across very aggressive. He was holding people accountable. Mm -hmm. All, all of those things were good things taken to extremes. And he, what he said, learned to do is he learned to lower his tone of voice, right? He, it was just his style, tiny tweaks. And then he went to, to not look like a bully so much anymore. So no, that's a great point. I mean, it, a lot of it is perception and how people, and this is what we always talk about, you know, in HR land is, is it, it's, it's about your, the perception of the person who receives the behavior. You know, it's, it's, it's like, am I, am I really being a jerk? Am I a jerk? Well, if someone perceives you to be a jerk, then I guess so. So, um, you know, whether you think so or not, if people are perceiving you as being a, a negative person, a jerk, toxic, then, then you, you probably are. Yeah. Good. All right. So I'm in a minute, I'm going to ask you about some of your tactics because I loved mm -hmm. them. But first I want to say hey to Sarah Grace. And Sarah, if you have a question, would love to uh, hear you know your questions about jerks at work. And Sean says, I found micromanagers are often tremendous individual contributors who don't actually have the leadership skills to be a good leader. You know, I, what do you think about that? No, that's a great point. And this is something, you know, my previous book, uh, Wait, I'm the Boss, um, I talk about a lot is that, you know, most of us aren't trained to be leaders. We aren't trained to be managers. You know, those of us in management roles, I know when I first became a manager, I wasn't given any training at all. I, I just had to use what I had seen. So I, I'd had a variety of different managers I'd worked around, you know, in my early years in business. And I had to just sort of say, well, what are they doing? Are they, you know, how do, how do they manage? And I had to kind of copy that behavior because I had never been trained in it. So I think a lot of us, um, 
a lot of us as managers, we don't get the training that we need to become good managers. And that, that, that just, we're just repeating the patterns that we learn. It's just like, yeah. you know, when you grow up as a kid, you repeat the, the things that you learn from your parents. And it's much the same yeah. in the workplace. You repeat what you learn from your boss, good or bad, yeah. <laughs> often bad. <laughs> So let's let's talk about some of these tactics. Uh, one of my favorites was refuse to play their game because it's so tempting to play their game, right? They do passive aggressive, and you're like, ah, maybe I can play that too. So what what unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, well, it it is a game. I think for you know we talk. I talked about it earlier about there being maybe a couple kinds of of toxic people: those that are consciously toxic, and those that are unconsciously toxic. And the ones that are, to you know, consciously toxic, they're playing a game. They're playing a game on you. They're, they're hoping to get a response. It's sort of like, you know, pushing a button on a video game. If I push the button hard enough and often enough, maybe I'll get something to happen. And, and this is what they want to do. They want to get you to play the game and, and get a reaction. And, and they enjoy that. They actually get some pleasure out of that. So, you know, first of all, you got to figure out um, that you're being played. I mean, you got to step back and say, hey, you know, I think I'm being played by this person. And I know I, I, that happened to me when I first uh, um, took on a new job. Uh, there was a person who thought I should um, they should be in my job, that they should have gotten my job. So they started playing a game on me. And uh, you have to recognize that you have to realize that you're reacting. And then what kind of game are they playing? What buttons are they pushing on you that, that cause you to start reacting? So you've got to get some understanding of how you're being manipulated by that person, that toxic person. What buttons are they pushing? And, and what do they do that pushes the button that makes you react? And then you've just got to, you know, become aware of that and then start taking those little buttons off of yourself. So when the person says something nasty in a staff meeting, um, stop responding. You know, I think you said it, Karen. You said, you know, these little things, they're, they're like these tiny habits, these little habits. And you start saying, okay, so whenever the person says something nasty, I react. Stop reacting. Just, just you know, step back, don't react, and see what happens. Um, and after a while, that person is going to realize, oh, okay, they're not reacting the way I want. Either they're going to try a different game on you, or they're just going to go to somebody else. So I think that's, you know, that's that strategy. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so Louisa is saying, is confrontation a good idea in that situation? Should you call them out? Yeah. Yeah, I think that in any situation, um, you know, getting the behavior out there is important. Uh, you shouldn't just sit back and, and take it. You shouldn't just hide it. You know, just say, oh, I don't want to make a big, big splash. I don't want to make waves. No, I think it's important to confront that person, not necessarily publicly, not, you know, in, in a staff meeting. So let's say that they're pushing my buttons in a staff meeting. I don't think it's, it's, it's really necessarily right to call them out right then and there in the staff meeting. But I think um, after the staff meeting, you take them aside and you say, look, you know, I don't appreciate your behavior. I don't appreciate you doing what you're doing, where you're saying, you know, whatever it is they're saying that makes gets you upset. Mm -hmm. uh, take them aside, say, I don't want you to do that. I'm not going to tolerate it. And yeah, so definitely call them out. But I would, I, you know, this is true in management in general. Um, when, when I talk about being a manager, you don't want to call people out in public and embarrass them. Yeah. Again, they might be unconsciously doing this. It might not be malicious. So take them aside after the meeting, but be, but you've got to, you've got to, um, you know, communicate, you've got to open that channel. Yeah. I, I agree with you so much. And if you do it publicly, it's just going to escalate the situation. But, you know, if you can calmly take them aside and say, Hey, this is the impact that that behavior is having on me. It can really turn things around. Yeah, so and Heisen it, is saying hello from Calgary. I wonder what kinds of jerks at work there are there. So uh, <laughs> love for you to ask your questions. Okay. So uh, let's go to one of the things you talk about is don't sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like that is something that I've learned over time, you know, that some things you just need to let go. What can you share a little bit of your thinking on that one? Yeah, I think there's it's it's like being in a in a relationship, you know, um, we all have things that we do. We all have habits we do that maybe the your, your partner is not fond of. Um, but it's not major. It's just little things like, you know, I, I, I when I come home from work, I. I watch TV and I, I eat popcorn or something and, and that just kind of bugs my partner. And the same the same thing is true at work. I mean, there are things that we do at work um, that bug other people. And I think as as a recipient on the receiving end of those those kinds of things, 
you've got to draw a line. You've got to say, okay, there's just a certain amount of things that aren't that big of a deal. There are certain things that aren't big, a big deal. If this person, you know, comes in from lunch, um, five minutes late every day, is it really a big deal? Um, if the boss doesn't think so, then maybe it's not a big deal. You should not obsess about their behavior when maybe your boss isn't worried about it. Um, I mean, that's a common thing where you'll just get little things will get under your skin. Don't, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't let those little things bug you. Um, save your energy for the big things that are a big deal uh, that affect you. And I think that was an interesting point from the previous um, you know, question is that, you know, when you confront somebody, when you, when you call it out, you're, you're doing that on behalf of not only of yourself, but your other coworkers. So you're actually helping everybody um, by calling out that behavior. And, you know, if, if you're going to not sweat the small stuff then same thing with other people, um, hopefully the other people aren't sweating the, the big, uh, the small stuff too. Uh, yeah, I think that's true, right? That breeds goodwill. They, if you know that you're doing some things that might be a little annoying, you're more willing to tolerate what, what they're doing. You know, I think the most of the time, people don't wake up and say, you know, how do I come to work today and just really tick Peter off? <laughs> it's just not, I mean, unless they're a psychopath, right? and, and, you know, that's just a very small percentage of the population. So most of the time, I think giving people the benefit of the doubt that they're not doing this on purpose. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're exactly right. People don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm a, I want to do a bad job at work. I really want to do it. I want people to not like what I do. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants people to like what they do and yeah. who they are. So you talk a good bit of, in the book about learn how to the, de-escalate the conflict or, you know, how, what are some specific techniques? If somebody is right now, like they're tuning in because they're like, okay, I got it. I got to go deal with the jerk this afternoon. I'm in conflict. What advice would you have for them? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the first thing you have to do is, you know, look at your situation objectively. Again, you step back from the emotion, what what are the, what are these emotions that are getting um, wrapped up in this, and not just for yourself, but for the other person? Um, so, you have to call out the behavior. You have to identify the behavior. You have to talk to that person. Um, you know, calmly. Um, you know, talk talk through what's going on. And everybody has conflict at work. I mean, we all do, and hopefully not a lot, but there's always going to be someone we're in conflict with. So you've just got to step back from the emotion. That's really the key thing and observe whatever's happening objectively. Um, and then figure out what that person's underlying needs are. So there's something going on. You know, when you're in conflict with someone, there's a reason for it. What is the, you know, what is the reason for that behavior? What is the underlying need this person has? Are they trying to get credit? They're not getting credit for something. Are they, you know, do they think they've got a better idea than you do and they're not being heard? Um, it could be a, a variety of different things. So, for example, if they're just not being heard, get them heard. You know, if, they, if they're in conflict because they don't think that you think that they're important enough to listen to their ideas, then, then resolve that. Figure out what the issue is. So, you know, everybody's got needs. Everybody's got, you know, aspirations. And if, if they're not being met, if they're not being heard, if they're being marginalized, then that often causes the conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So Sean is saying, do you think having a foundation of trust in your team is critical to productive accountability and conflict resolution? Yeah. Yeah. For me, trust is everything. I mean, I, I write articles all the time. I write books all the time. Too much, too much writing. I need a break. <laughs> um, but um yeah, I mean, trust is everything. It's the foundation of everything we do, um, not just in business, but in life, but but focusing on business. People have to trust each other. They have to trust their team. They have to trust the people they work with. They have to trust their boss, their boss's boss. I mean, that trust is is, is foundational. And I think that when, when the trust isn't there, that's when people become disengaged. That's when people don't bring their best ideas. That's when people are worried that um, if they contribute something, they're going to get shot down. Um, they might get punished. I mean, people have ideas. I mean, I've, that's, that's a huge problem. You know, people um, being punished for, for something that's, that, that they didn't, you know, mm -hmm. think was, was that bad of a thing. Yeah. So, so you've got to build trust and you've got to have trust. And I think anybody who's on a team needs to, 
do things that build more trust. And, and the same with bosses. Bosses need to do things that build more trust in the, in the teams. Mm-hmm. So it. then the follow-up question was, what's the best way to, to uh, build that trust? It, it's doing what you say. It, it's, 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 you know, doing what you saying, what you, what mean doing what you say, I think, whatever that saying is. Mm-hmm. Um, when you promise somebody something, you, you follow through with it. I remember when I was back working in the corporate world, uh, my boss would say, you know, I want you to bring me your ideas. I want you to bring me your best ideas. I want you to bring your suggestions for how we can do better, do better things. And so in the staff meeting, we would do that. We, we started bringing ideas. We started, you know, coming through with all this great stuff. And then that boss, I mean, almost literally took those ideas, stuck them in a file folder and, and, and just filed them away. And, you know, we quickly realized that everybody on the team, you know, quickly realized that um, that boss is not listening to us, doesn't really care. So um, that was a, a, a break in our trust. Our trust was broken. So I think that when you promise something, when you ask somebody for something, for their input, for whatever it might be, um, thank them, cherish them, um, put those ideas into action. Don't just file them away. Uh, yeah. That's a great way to build trust. I, I agree with you. It's, that's also very consistent with our research. We found that you know 50% of folks said the reason they didn't share ideas is that nothing would ever happen. So if you are asked for ideas and you're not responding or you're, you're not closing that feedback loop, people are just going to shut it down. They're going to exactly. stop and you lose the trust. You know, Charles Green has that trust equation, which is one of my favorite ways of thinking about trust, which is, you know, credibility. So trust equals credibility. Like, do people think you know what you're doing, right? Do they trust that you're competent? Reliability, do they count on you to do what you say you're going to do, as you're saying, right? Intimacy, do I have a connection with you? Mm -hmm. And that's all in the numerator. And then in the denominator, it's self-orientation. Do I think I'm, you're out for yourself or do I think you have my best interest at heart? Uh, and it, it, all those factors play together. And it's interesting, you know, when we're, we're working with groups that are in deep crisis for trust, it's interesting to go through those and say, which, where is this breaking down? Right. You know? So, um, Sean says that's straight from your book. Yes, respond with regards, straight from our book. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, Weston says, what do you do about the person that thrives on conflict and drama but does not do anything worthy of firing, right? Oh, gosh, we've all worked for that guy or gal. Yeah. What would you say there? Good, Great question, Weston. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess it depends on how much this conflict and drama is impacting the team. There, you know, this is just a personality of certain kinds of people. They love, they thrive on, like you said, conflict and drama. And if if it's impacting the team negatively, then I, I think as as a boss, you know, you need to address it. Um, you can't just let it go on. And it may not be a fireable offense per se, but if if it's negatively impacting the team, you've got to neutralize it in some way. You've got to call out the behavior. You've got to somehow get them to become aware of it and, and, and tone it down. Um, it may require a lot of counseling. It may be require a lot of you just sitting with that person and, and just every time it happens saying, you just did that today, look what happened. Um, I've got an upset employee here, or I've got an upset team or something, you know, there's some negative aspect to it. And I think if, it, if it's an ongoing thing that negatively a- impacts the team, that could potentially be grounds for letting them go. I mean, it's not a fireball offense. Maybe they didn't steal something. Maybe they didn't consciously um, set up a bed in the back of their office and go to sleep. You know, those kinds of fireball offenses. But if if it's an ongoing thing that negatively impacts your team and you can't get them to stop, I think you have to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a requirement of this job that you are going to work effectively on a team, right? And so here's my expectations. Mm -hmm. And you must meet these expectations if you're not meeting those expectations. And now we have a pattern, right? So yeah, so good. Thank you. I I have to get to this last question. But David Dye, my husband and business partner is pointing out, yes, we have an upcoming episode all about trust. Uh, David Horsehager's new book, uh, The Trusted Leader is also coming out in a couple of weeks. He will be our guest on Asking for a Friend. So great. Thanks for for that, uh, David. Okay. So I have to end with this question because it's, what do you do if you've got a really high producer, a high performer, 
This happens in sales teams all the time, mm -hmm. but they are such a jerk. And, uh, you know, what we often find is that people are afraid to fire that person because of the what they're afraid will happen with the business results. And I loved your chapter. It was probably my favorite chapter wow. where you say hire slow, fire fast. So we have a few minutes left. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. Yeah. And this is a, a conundrum that, you know, particularly on sales teams, but I've seen it everywhere in an organization where you've got a, a high performer and they are toxic. They're just super toxic and everybody suffers as a result. And it, it's a real difficult situation for, you know, a manager to deal with. Um, you know, if you've got a VP of sales, who's, who's a star, but everybody is just trying to avoid them and they're, so anyway, um, you've got to deal with it. You've got, you, you can't, Tol tolerate it, even though you're afraid that they're going, their loss is going to impact the team negatively, is going to result in less sales, far less sales potentially. Just think about how many people are leaving your company. How much turnover do you have because of this jerk? How many people are actually, you know, looking for a new job because of this jerk? I mean, um, you know, Gallup's done research. The, the number one reason why people leave their jobs is be because of their boss. That's the number one reason. If, and if this person is someone's boss and there's a lot of turnover, then that's that's a big problem. So take your time hiring, slide, you know, hire slow, do lots of interviews, do lots of background checks. I mean, check the social media. Uh, that's the huge thing nowadays is checking social media. Are they being a jerk on social media? Chances are they'll be a jerk when they show up in the workplace. Yeah. And don't tolerate that. I mean, just just think about the flip side of, of people leaving your organization because they, they just don't want to work with this person. And then you get a reputation. Your, your organization gets a rep reputation for this person, that this person's a jerk. People won't come to your organization. You won't get great people because the word will get out there. You'll see stuff on Glassdoor. Boy, that VP of, of sales is a jerk. You know, I, you, you don't want to work there. Or you'll see it on again, you know, people will get the, the, the word around and you'll lose that internal recruiting too. And one of the best channels of recruiting is that internal employee recruiting. You know, people say, oh, I've got a friend. Um, you should consider them to work here. And you're going to lose that too. So you just lose a lot. Um, yeah. Hire slow, take your time, but then fire fast when you've got a problem, even if that person is a big performer. I agree with you so much, particularly if that person is in a leadership role, because you are tolerating that behavior. I can't tell you how many times. So there was this really, when I was back in my corporate days, there was this really jerky, very high level person. And, you know, and I was teaching my people, you can't act that way. You can't lead that way. You must lead, you know, as a human centered leader, right? You're, you've got, that's how we're going to get the best out of all the people. They're like, what about her? <laughs> right? Why is she making it? You know, and so that and that's very hard for a, a you know a junior level executive to explain why are we tolerating that behavior when we won't tolerate it from you? You know, exactly. You got to walk your talk, as we say. And that's part of trust, building that trust. Yeah. Okay. So I want to just end with if one last piece of advice you would have, and then also make sure let let people know where they can find your your book. Yeah. So the one last piece of advice is, is, you know, don't be a jerk yourself. Uh, be very aware of your own behavior. You know, look at what you do. So don't be a jerk. You don't need to be a jerk. Yeah. Um, as far as my book, you can go to petereconomy.com. The book again is wait, I'm working with who and uh, go to my website. It's right there on my homepage. You can click the, the picture of the book and go to Amazon. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, Peter. Um, it has been an absolute delight to talk with you about one of my favorite topics. And thank you so much for all the work you've done over the years to grow leaders. Uh, you've, you've, it's all very practical, which we love. So well, thank you so much, Karen. It was great being here with you today. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.